Before we just dive into this really great night here, I just wanted to tell you a brief little story about how Code Tenderloin started running its classes uh, out of Ghetto Fight, because it's kind of fun. So uh, a few years ago, we were looking at building an arts venue in the Tenderloin. Uh, we found a great space. It's the former original Joe's space at 144 Taylor Street. Uh, and we had to go to a bunch of meetings in the Tenderloin because nothing happens in the TL unless you go to meetings. That's kind of the deal. Uh, so we went to a bunch of meetings. I met Del Seymour. And at that time, Del was giving uh, walking tours, Tenderloin walking tours. Has anyone been on a TL walking tour? Let me hear it. All right. And those walking tours were pretty fun, and they would always walk past piano fights. And I would be outside smoking cigarettes, and I'd wave at Dell and say, hey, Dell," And he'd say, hey, Rob, and then he'd keep walking past piano fights. So I, at some point I said, hey, man, did you make uh, us a stop on your tour? And he said, of course. So eventually we became the last stop on his tour. And finally, after a while, uh, we said, hey, Dell, we noticed that you uh, have some downtime between tours. Do you want a place to uh, come in and take a load off and relax and do some work and make some phone calls and whatnot. He said, sure. So we said, all right, let's make Piano Fight the home of Tenderloin walking tours. And we did. And then a few months after that, Dell was talking about this idea about Code Tenderloin, about helping folks from the neighborhood or who are in a neighborhood situation. We talked about it a little bit. He can give you the, the reasons behind it. But we liked the idea a lot. And so we said, hey, Dell, why don't you start all this in your classes out of the theaters at Piano Fight. And he did. And uh, what was really nice about it was that we got to trick him into doing this. So essentially, he was outside one day, I bopped him over the head, I dragged him inside <laughs> Piano Fight, and I woke him up and I said, you're stuck here. And he said, fine. And that's a decision that he'll no doubt regret for years to come, but it's a decision that I am uh, I don't know about you. extremely grateful for for all the incredible work that Code Tenderloin has done over the years. Um, part of the thing that's fun about having Code Tenderloin in the building, where, when you work every day, is uh, all the folks you get to meet. Tons of students, obviously, who are incredible. Some of them are here tonight. Anybody who is in Code Tenderloin as a program, let me hear you guys. Let me make some noise. Yeah, what's up? All right. There it is. So it's fun to get to meet those folks, but then there's some other folks that are you get to meet, which is also fun. Uh, one of those people I want to invite up onto the stage right now, he's uh, intensely more eloquent than I am, uh, and he's been a big supporter of Code Tenderloin for years. He was also, I don't know if you guys know this, the only local San Francisco politician to receive an endorsement from former President Barack Obama. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the new District 6 Supervisor, Matt Haney. Thank you, Rob. I feel like with a name like Rob Reddy, you're always going to be the MC. Actual name. That's great. Uh, how's everybody doing? Good? Yeah? This is a nice space, by the way. Who's, who's, whoever's responsible for this space, shout out to you. Um, well, first of all, I'm just really proud and grateful to be here at the first ever uh, Five Corners fundraiser uh, for Code Tenderloin. Are there any people in here who love and support Code Tenderloin? Let me just say that. Okay. Um, you know, I, I first learned about uh, Code Tenderloin probably like a lot of people in this room, um, which is that I met Dell on the street. Uh, Dell is somebody, uh, you know he is connected to the people, uh, you know he's out there doing work, uh, because every time you walk out on the street in the Tenderloin, more likely than not you're going to run into him. And, when I learned about what, what Code Tenderloin uh, is, and when I got to meet with some of the graduates and participants, some of the staff, what became very clear to me is that if Code Tenderloin is successful, San Francisco will be successful. And, and what, what I mean by that is, in San Francisco, we, we've decided that we are going to have a model of our economy where we're gonna constantly be growing where every time you look around, you see a new building, you see a new company that's coming in, and we support that. That's something that's, that's fostered in our city. But at the same time, what we also see is that we're not including everybody in our success. People who have so much to offer, people who are creative, people who are brilliant, people who are hardworking, 
They deserve, too, to benefit from that success. And, you know, sometimes there's sort of a sense of that that we all have, but we don't know how to get there. Um, and it takes a person to come along to actually have that vision and be able to make it into reality. And I remember standing with, with Dell one day, and we were talking about how we make sure that we get more people to hire from the Tenderloin. And he told me, you know, I'll tell you, you come in, there's a lot of people who come into our community and they want to put up a flag. They come in, they say, we're here, we're going to put up a flag. This is ours now. And what Dell said is, you know what? That's okay, you can put up your flag. I don't actually have a problem with that. I'm fine with you putting your flag up here. But don't put your flag at the top. The community's flag is always at the top. The community's flag is always at the top. So we have a lot of space and a lot of love for everybody to be a part of San Francisco, and we're excited about that. But let's make sure we remember that all of us need to be working to include all of the folks in our community, especially in the Tenderloin, to be a part of that success. And Dell, I just want to tell you, uh, and I know this is about the organization, not just about you, uh, but you are absolutely a treasure for our city. And we are so grateful for you and what you have done. You know, every, every now and again, there's somebody who comes along, and it's very rare, um, who has lived it, who has been through it, who knows who's been, at the, who's been at the bottom, who's seen the worst of what our society can be and, and what it does to people, and come out of that more hopeful, with a deeper belief in humanity. And not just people who, are, who, who might be going through it, like you went through it, but a deeper belief in what all of us can do together. So I want to thank you for believing in us. I want to thank you for believing in every single person individually, and even more importantly than that, believing in what we can do collectively. So thank you, Dell. Thank you, Coach Tenderloin. Uh, let's make sure that we support this organization and do it as successful as we can do together. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, one more time for District Supervisor Matthew Haney. Good looking man. As you all know, this is a fundraiser in which we'll be raising funds for Code Tenderloin. So knock back a few more drinks, guys. Just have a couple more and get a little looser with that wallet. And perhaps make a bid on some of these gorgeous art pieces that we have had custom made by local San Francisco artists. They're beautiful. Check these out when you get a chance. They're, of course, uh, hung up here on the walls of what used to be the Avalon Ballroom, uh, which is a pretty famous, historic San Francisco venue. Of course, it is now a famous and historic San Francisco advertising agency. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, please help me welcome to the stage our uh, one of our hosts for the evening. He is the co-founder and chief creative officer of Argonaut, ladies and gentlemen, Hunter Hinman. I personally was very lucky on that day uh, by pure chance 
to be partnered with Dell on the walking tour. And it was a very rainy day. We were huddled together under umbrellas with the entire staff at Argonaut. Um, but I learned so much about the Tenderloin neighborhood, the history. But more importantly that day, I learned a ton about Dell's mission and the special organization that he had created in Code Tenderloin. Uh, we all met up at a piano fight afterwards. Uh, and we were supposed to, you know, head back to the building, you know, have a party, do our thing. But we ended up so entranced by Dell's story and what he was building. We hung out for hours, um, hearing more and more, and so blown away by, by this unique mission. On that day as well, if you click ahead, we actually had a group of artists create custom works of art that were inspired by the walking tour. Um, and they happened right up here on this exact stage. Uh, one of those pieces of art, if you click ahead to the next, the next slide, was a piece created by an artist named John Soto. And there's a really specific, this, this piece in general, it's a bunch of really amazing uh, hidden imagery within it and symbolism. There's one piece that really stood out as part of the walking tour. And that is the, uh, the yellow foot, actually, it's right here at the center of this piece. It was simple to represent the Yellow Steps Project and the Safe Passage group uh, that helped children make their way through the Tenderloin. We were deeply inspired by that story and the history of it, what, what that group has done. But more importantly, I think it connects to the vision that Dell has of actually creating a path forward for this underserved community to help them with job readiness and really bringing down the barriers that are holding them back from the economic equity that I think this community deserves being so close uh, to so many prosper. Similarly tonight, we have had a group of artists uh, create both custom works um, and also donated works uh, that we're doing a silent auction for. Um, so I would actually take a moment here and please ask if uh, the artists that are with us, if you could raise your hands. I don't know how many have been gathered yet, but I'd love to give some thanks to them. Thank you so, so, so very much. I'd just like to thank all of the volunteers that have made this event possible, both from Argonaut and from Code Tenderloin. Uh, but most importantly, I would love to thank and give a round of applause to both the students who have graduated and the current students of Code Tenderloin that are with us tonight. Let's have a great night, everybody. Welcome to the Avalon Ballroom. Thank you so much for being here. And get out there and bid. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up one more time for our hosts, Argonaut and Hunter Hindman right here. For these next couple of folks who are going to come up and speak, they're going to tell you some pretty personal uh, stories. So, if you're next to somebody who's chopping it up loudly or even softly, just be a dick and shush them. Make them feel awkward and ashamed. Okay, great. I'm glad we worked that out, guys. That's awesome. Um, so our next speaker up tonight, uh, I would not be surprised if everyone in this room knows him on a first name basis. I would not be surprised if everyone in the Tenderloin knows him on a first name basis. I am constantly surprised by the like titans of industry and politics that know him on a first name basis. It's really stunning. Um, and I feel honored and privileged uh, to have known this man for about 10 years now, which I'm pretty shocked about, 10 years. Um, he's a close friend, and man, oh man, is he doing the Lord's work. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the founder of Code Tenderloin, Del Seymour. <laughs> I had 
had no idea we would have anywhere near these many people. And I'm just, man, I'm just blown away by this. This shows I'm not the only one that believes in the Tenderloin. It's, we, we got at least 200 people in this room that believe in the Tenderloin. Way to go. So of course I want to we thank Argonaut. Can you believe they gave us this building? Just gave it to us? This is awesome, guys. And they have full-time employees working on this event for the last six months at least. We're here sometimes till 8 or 9 o'clock at night. So this is just something that we thought of yesterday. So thank you very much. There's so many people in this room I can thank who will be here all night, but I just want to shout out to Glide. Glide is so wonderful what they do for us. Thank you, Glide. And, and Glide is in the room. I want to thank, I want to thank Joe and to Hilton. Hilton has just been our, our, our renaming of our, thank you Hilton Hotel. I want to thank some personal friends of mine at Zendesk. Zendesk has been around this community since the very beginning. I want to congratulate you on your new project of the food trucks on market. You activated the market between six and seven. Way to go, Zendex, thank you. I mean, we have so many people in this room that I can, I, I really, I will be here all night. Cecil and Jan from Glide were on the way here and Cecil's not feeling well, but he sends his, sends his love. The mayor's office, she cannot be here tonight, but she sends her love also, and she's also going to have one of her reps here. But we got OEWD here. Where's OEWD? Office of Economic Workforce Development. They really, they really keep us going and make sure our lights stay on. Thank you, OEWD. Uh, there's so many companies here. Uh, I want to thank my family. I want to thank the board of directors, the staff, the volunteers. You know, because it's all about that one person we deal with. And as a lot of you all know, I spent about 18 years homeless. And I actually almost forgot how bad that was. Yesterday, I lost, I locked myself out of my house. My wallet's in the house, my phone's, I only got like 30 seconds left on my phone. I didn't have any money. I don't know my neighbors, I guess I should, but I don't know my neighbors, and I was just out there. My key, I couldn't get keys for four hours. So I was like lost for four hours. And I thought about what if I was lost for 24 hours? Didn't have money, didn't have keys, didn't have nowhere to go, didn't know nobody. We got 13,000 people outside this door like that right now. So that re re reminded me of our job that we have to do here. One thing that we do at Code Tenderloin, we tell our people, don't aim far and miss, aim close and hit. And that seems to work very well with our folks. First of all, I want to tell you all, we got so much food here tonight. We got to go to containers, so please feel free to take one. You know, I'm usually very clean shaven, and everyone here tonight asks me, Dale, you can't even shave when you're your event. Well, there's a reason for that. My wife came to me two weeks ago and told me she wanted to be with an older man. <laughs> so I says, okay, so I start growing this beard, right? So I went to her the other day, I says, what do you think? She says, no, you got it confused. I wanted a different older man. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm not married, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm married to my 1976 Cadillac, that's my law. And she don't treat me right sometimes, so. <laughs> you know, when I was, I was formerly on the fire department in Los Angeles, and one of the firefighters in my station was a 60-year-old African-American that had been on the fire department 40 years, and they never made it past firefighter because that's how LA City Fire Department was. They had no black captains. Well, he was promoted to captain, and we were in the same station. And right, at, right after he became captain, I came down from the, from the sleeping area one night about three o'clock in the morning. And he was sitting in a chair with tears rolling down his eyes, 
looking at his fire engine. And he realized his dream finally came true to be the first black captain in the Los Angeles City Fire Department. When I walked in this room at three o'clock and sat down and saw how this company had set Code Tenderloin up, this has been my dream. I go to hundreds of these, never been to mine, never been to ours. So you don't have any idea how I feel. So, <laughs> so I just want to introduce you to somebody real quick because I'm running out of time. They gave me 13 minutes and I'm 72 years old. A 72 year old man can't do nothing in 13 minutes. <laughs> if you get my drift, you know what I mean. So I want to introduce one of our first graduates from Code Tenderloin and also the person that inspired me to open up Code Tenderloin because she saw the need and conveyed to me, I believe what she said to me and I opened up Code Tenderloin because of her. And then we just say a few words, 30 seconds. So I'm going to end my part of the program because Rob is looking at me real weird over there. But that's, that's every day though. But tonight, we're going to have an award here tonight. It's called the Jeff Adachi Community Award. Yeah. And this award will be given out to two people in this room. Now it was a problem because there are so, dozens of people in this room that will qualify for the Jeff Adachi Award. So we came down to two finalists, and I did, I'm, ve I'm very ethical, all right? And it's not about how much money you donate to Coach Hill and all of that. This, I'm very ethical about what I do. So it came down to the fact that who took me to lunch most last year? <laughs> so the first award, bring it up. And there are a lot of people in this room that could deserve this award, but. This is the first annual community award, Jeff Adachi Community Award. You want to read the name on it? The name on here. Carlene Barlene. Carolyn Barlene. Carolyn Barlene. Carolyn, Carolyn. Carolyn. has been with Coach Tillman since day one. Let's give a hand for Carol. And the next award will be the Jeff Adachi Lifetime Community Achievement Award. Scott. 
Sean has been there for us night and day. Several times we were close to having our lights cut out, and she came in at the very last minute just in time. So thank you, Joan. Thank you very much. Thank you. So continue to eat and have beverages. Look at the art, not only look at it, but buy some. Give some donations out the door. You, not, I got a very extended family. Thank you so much. God bless. Have a good night. This is seemingly endless. So uh, they put together a video, and we're going to share that right now. The next time that you cross Marcus Street, notice something. There's an invisible border between those we look up to and those that we look down on. Crossing it takes much more than looking left, right, and then left again. At Cold Tenderloin, we're building a bridge from the less fortunate side of the market to the more fortunate one. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up one more time for Argonaut for making that video possible. That's been a big uh, fundraising tool for the staff and volunteers of Code Tenderloin and the board. Um, so we're going to keep going on. We've got two more speakers. And then after the speakers are done, um, Chance the Rapper is going to do a, shit, a set, and it's going to be a crazy party in here. I know, I'm excited too. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, ladies and everyone, this next speaker is gonna share some pretty personal stuff with you. So once again, if, uh, if I could get my folks all around this room to calm, this, uh, calm down the chatter. I feel so powerful when you guys help me do that. Feels really good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and everyone, uh, she is a graduate of Co Tenderloin, and she now is a rock star at Microsoft. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Shelly Winter. things that I had to do, 
And so I contacted my counselor and I said, listen, I really want to do this program. Is there any way you can work around that? She said, absolutely. So I ended up doing the program. And um, at the time, uh, it was Leslie. Leslie was the director. Now it's Vicki. But uh, Leslie helped um, do my resume. And she took, they took me on these field trips. And one of the first places that we went was Microsoft. And we went to actually went to the retail store. And while I was there, one of the girls that worked there uh, told me that they were hiring and that I should apply. So Leslie helped me drop together an amazing resume. I applied and they contacted me for an interview like a week later. And I just thought, oh my God, my, yeah, right? Microsoft's contacting me for an interview. And this is amazing. This is like my opportunity. I need to kill it in this interview, right? So, of course, Code Tenderloin, guess what they do? They help you with your interviewing skills. So they had me doing so many mock interviews that by the time I went in for my real interview, I killed it. Yeah. 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 And she hired me right after the interview. Right after the interview. And I was like, I was like, okay, um, she doesn't know I have a criminal record. I, I, gotta, I gotta tell her. So I was like, all right, well, yes, I would like the position, but I have to tell you something. I have a criminal record. Um, I, I, it's not who I am today, but you know, I, I just wanted to be you know, open about that. She was like, oh yeah, it's not gonna be a problem. Don't worry about it. Just be honest on it, you know, about it on the background check, and then um, we'll go from there. So I was. And then the background check came back, and they rescinded my job offer. And, yeah, yeah, but don't worry. <laughs> um, so yeah, they rescinded my job offer and I was devastated because I had told everybody, oh my God, I got the job at Microsoft and my life's gonna change and then they're like, nope. But you know, in that time of like rejection and that, that, that fear that I had, I didn't give up. You know, and I think that's what's important is not to give up when faced with those challenges. And I wrote Microsoft a heartfelt letter, and I said, listen, here's who I am today. I know I've made some mistakes, but here's who I am. Here's everything I've done to change my life. And um, here's why you should hire me. And you know what?
So our next speaker is going to tell you about a little bit more about that. He works over at Humu, uh, and he's done a bunch of work with Code Tenderloin. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Griffin Gaffney. so much for having me tonight, um, Argonaut, all the sponsors, I am honored to be here a little bit, having imposter syndrome. <laughs> um, but I want to share with you that in December, the company I work for, Humu, it's an HR startup down in Mountain View, hired a Code Tenderline graduate as a full-time software engineer. It's amazing. Um, I wish that I was here to tell you all the success stories of this person. Um, but what I want to focus on instead is actually, despite everything that I'm doing, the full support of my company, and everything that we've changed to accommodate this person, why I think the default mode for this person is to fail. Um, I think because over the past two years, I've actually helped five people experiencing homelessness get jobs at Bay Area tech companies. Every single one of them has quit or been fired. The first time I did this was in 2017. Um, I started, it started with me hearing about an organization that addresses homelessness through running. I'm an avid marathon runner, so I decided I've got to get into that. Three mornings a week at 5.45 in the morning, I'd head down to the Tenderloin and run and walk with other volunteers and folks who are experiencing homelessness. Much to my surprise, I started meeting people that had extensive career experience some of whom, I found out, actually had more experience to be having the job that I had than I was. And at the time, I was at a startup company that was hiring in droves, so it seemed pretty simple to me. We've got jobs, I have people who need jobs, let's put them in the interview process and everything will work out. The first candidate I worked with was someone named John. John had over 20 years of work experience. He started as a sales clerk at Barney's in New York City and rose his way up all the way to eventually managing their international expansion, all before he ended up experiencing homelessness. And after hours spent with him on those morning runs, I was confident he could ace any interview process, so we started. I told John he should interview for a entry-level customer support role, and to be honest, he was pretty hesitant at first because he had so much career experience. But I invited him to work for lunch, I interviewed, or showed him all of the perks of a beautiful tech company, the free food, the gym memberships, all of that, um, and he still wasn't convinced. But I said, trust me, you will get this, and you will love working here. And it wasn't soon after that I had heard from our recruiting team that he actually aced the interview process. They said he had glowing reviews, obviously he had a ton of experience. The next step was for John to complete a computer-based written project. And at the time, John was living in a shelter. So he actually meticulously typed out multiple essays on a phone in a shelter huddled next to the power outlet. What I later for found out when John was rejected is that when that written project was shown on a laptop computer, the formatting didn't look right. Um, it looked sloppy, according to our recruiting team. And given the volume of applicants that we had at that time, it just wasn't good enough. The recruiting team basically told me, this doesn't meet our bar. So a few weeks after John's rejection, I met another person named Max. And Max was a banker and a tennis umpire. Again, tons of experience before experiencing homelessness. But Max had told me that he also had a passion for cooking and that he wanted to grow it into a profession. Lucky for him, the company I worked for had a kitchen that prepared three meals a day for employees, and I was close to the head chef. So I phoned in a friend, and one day over lunch, I went to the head chef, and I said, hey, I've got this candidate for you. Can we please wait in the interview process? I just want to get him a job. The chef agreed, and the next day, Max started as a dishwasher. And feeling like my name was now on the line, I did everything that I could to make Max a sex successful. I showed up at 6 a.m. on his first day of work. I baked him chocolate chip cookies. I introduced him to everybody I knew, and I visited him multiple times a day in the dish pit, as they called it. 
uh, to make sure that things were going well. And when I asked his boss how he was doing, his boss said, I've never seen someone work this hard. I knew that would happen. But after Max's first month, he started to become irritable. And I noticed that he would spend all of his lunch breaks looking on his phone. At first I was too nervous to ask what was going on, but eventually I started to cry. And I found out that despite putting his name on a 90-day bed placement list weeks before starting his job, he was number 900 on the list and was about to lose his housing. My heart sank, but I knew that we had to get work to work. I helped Max figure out how to use the company's showers so that he could show up to work looking clean without anybody knowing it. I loaned him money so that he could stay in hostels, and I left the office early to usher him around the city from shelter to shelter. Eventually, Max decided that he wanted to launch a crowdfunding campaign to pay for housing and to go to culinary school, two things that we both thought would help him get back on his feet. We announced the campaign to the company, and within days, he raised $15,000. With that money, Max enrolled in culinary school and began to stabilize his housing situation. But without a living wage or access to vital support services, that stability came as soon as it, or came and went very quickly. And it was only a matter of weeks before he was back on the street. After Max left the company, I helped three more people experiencing homelessness find work there. All of them were fired. And with that experience, I now know that there's a long list of things that I could have done better to help John and Max. And luckily, with the support of Humu, I've gotten to do those things with the Code Tenderloin graduate that I work with today. We kept the graduate's housing status confidential throughout the interview and hiring process. We offered him a sizable signing bonus so that this Code Tenderloin graduate could cover a security deposit and first, month, first month's rent before they started at the company. We made sure that they had a mentor at the company who'd be ready to help them learn new skills, and we even launched an industry loan line available to any employee at the company who needs access to quick cash to cover major expenses. In my opinion, we are undoubtedly a stronger employer because of all these changes. But what I realize today is that those changes don't even come close to guaranteeing this Code Tenderloin graduate's success. Those changes cannot overcome a culture that's turned its back on people experiencing homelessness, one that readily rejects at the first sign of difference or that willingly watches a friend and colleague return to the streets. The Code Tenderloin graduate I work with today captured the sentiment very well in the first email that they sent me asking whether they could interview for a job at Humu. This person said, it seems few care. I've managed to overcome extreme poverty and economic violence while expecting me to compete with people in the job market who can't comprehend what it's like to sleep on a sidewalk for years. I figure nobody would ever hire me if I said I was homeless. I think this is the last time I'm going to bother asking for help and understanding because frankly, I'm tired of wasting my time. I wasn't invited to speak here tonight because I'm an expert of homelessness, and I wasn't invited because I have the solution. I don't, I don't think there is one. I'm here because I found a problem and made a commitment to addressing it in the ways that I can. I'm here despite, to say that despite what I've seen, I still hope that the default outcome can be success. And if there's one piece of advice that I've learned over the past two years working with these folks, it's that you've got to hold on to that hope and remember that the small changes you make will shift our culture one story at a time. Thanks, everybody. Keep it going for Griffin and Gaffney, ladies and gentlemen. All right, we're, we're, uh, we're wrapping up here, but uh, since we're sharing, I wanted to tell one uh, that's near and dear to my heart. Um, so as I said earlier in the night, I'm one of the founders of Piano Fight, which is an indie arts venue on Taylor Street. Yeah, thanks. And uh, we met this guy uh, who's a close friend of Dell's. His name's Alonzo, really nice dude. Alonzo hadn't had a job in 10 years, 30 years. Alonzo hadn't had a job in 30 years. He'd been hanging out on the corner 
of Taylor and Eddie just hanging, just doing his thing. Uh, he got synced up with Dell, they were close, still are. Dell got him uh, an interview uh, for a security, a front door security job at a building nearby. He got hired. He was on a trial basis for about three months. After three months, he was doing a great job. They said, hey, you're full time. Three months later, they gave him health insurance. That gave his wife health insurance. Three months after that, they leased a new apartment. And about six months after that, he bought his first car that he had ever bought in his life. That is once again one of the stories, just one of the stories that are rampant throughout Code Tenderloin. And as all you folks know, you, cut, you live, you work down in here in this neighborhood, you're here. And I want everybody to know, because when I, when I first started Open, open Piano Fight in 2014, we'd been down here for about, I don't know, six years before that? 2007 is when we started. And every day was really intense. You know, I'm a straight, cis, white dude. I grew up middle class. Coming down to 6th Street is intense. And it was scary. But you walk around 6th Street, you walk around the Tenderloin, you meet folks like Dell, you meet folks like Victoria and Donna. Give it up for the two full-time staff of Code Tenderloin. These guys are fucking heroes. You meet folks like Alonzo, you meet folks like Shelly, you meet folks like Griffin, on every side of this equation. And everybody has something that they can do. Everybody has something that they can contribute. By the fact that you are here tonight supporting this organization, you are contributing to making a better world for the people around you, and you should feel fucking great about that. So if you haven't already, find a Code Tenderloin graduate, find a board member, find a volunteer. We're wearing these buttons. We will speak passionately about this organization and what it does to change lives every day of the week. Find somebody with an iPad who's walking around, kick them five bucks, kick them 10 bucks, kick them 10,000 bucks. Check out this gorgeous art that local artists donated to this organization and put a bid on it. Bring this home with you tonight because folks, three months ago, we didn't know what this was gonna be. We were worried about selling 50 tickets. We sold 390 tickets for tonight. And just on sales alone, just on ticket sales, that's not counting anything else, we raised over $16,000 for this organization. And that is thanks to each and every one of you who purchased a ticket. So thank you so, 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 so much for being here. We have a ton of food. We got a ton of booze. If you can, pack some up, take some food out, give it to people on the street when you leave, take it home with you, enjoy yourselves, mix, mingle, and donate more money. Thank you on behalf of Code Tenderloin.